Ohio Senate race taking center stage with just 72 days to go until the primary election. I am the one with a conservative record of achievement and results. Why Matt Dolan says he's the candidate who can unseat incumbent Senator Sherrod Brown in November. No matter who the GOP candidate is, polling experts say the Senate race will likely be a toss-up. I think in terms of political environment, this is probably the hardest. The issues that could make it a tough election cycle for both parties in Ohio. And lawmakers will get back to work at the State House in the coming week. The veto overrides at the top of their agenda and what new business they're undertaking in the coming weeks. The longest running political show in central Ohio starts now. This is NBC4's The Spectrum with Colleen Marshall. Republicans need a net gain of two seats to take control of the United States Senate, and they've set their sights on Ohio and unseating the state's senior senator, Democrat Sherrod Brown. Welcome to The Spectrum. I'm Colleen Marshall. Today and over the next two weekends, you're going to be hearing from each of the three candidates who are vying for the Republican nomination in the all-important 2024 Senate race. That means you will hear from all of them ahead of our statewide GOP Senate debate that's set for Monday, January 22nd. Well, late last month, the former president, Donald Trump, endorsed Cleveland area businessman Bernie Marino. That came as a surprise to the Secretary of State, Frank LaRose, another candidate, who told me Trump had personally assured him he would not be making any endorsement in the Ohio Senate race. The third candidate, State Senator Matt Dolan, knew he would never get a Trump endorsement. But as you will hear this morning, Dolan finds that ironic because he believes he is the most Trump-like candidate in the race. The irony is I'm the one talking about Trump's tax policies, Trump's border security, Trump's Abraham Accords. I'm the one out there saying that when we actually execute as Republicans and get things done, our country is better off. So the reality is the things I am focused on, Donald Trump did really well on and Ohioans were better off. That's why he wins. So I'm saying send me to Washington and we will execute on the exact same things that you are so, you know, want Trump to do it. And if Trump's the nominee, great, we'll do it together. But if he's not, I'll do it with whoever the Republican nominee is. And that's my focus. It's not on anything else. It is on what is in the best interest of Ohioans each and every day. A strong endorsement for the policies of Donald Trump, even though Trump vowed to never endorse Matt Dolan. The former president was angry when Dolan's family changed the name of their team, the Cleveland Indians, to the Cleveland Guardians, accusing the Dolans of bowing to political correctness. But Matt Dolan says he is a policy candidate. Because there's challenges our country continues to face, and Sherrod Brown is not facing them. And I am, I am the one with a conservative record of achievement and results that I have brought to Ohio in my position as finance chair in the Senate and the House. I have private sector experience, and I want to bring both of those, beat Sherrod Brown, but most importantly, go to Washington, execute, and get things done. We just don't get things done in this country anymore, and we have to. Be specific about what hasn't been done that you think needs to be resolved. We have to secure our border. We, we cannot say we have a sovereign nation if we don't know who or what is coming across our border. Sherrod Brown do, doesn't even want to acknowledge that the border problem even exists. I mean, I'm running an ad with his own words saying he thinks it's a far right problem. Yet there's mayors in New York and there's Democratic mayors in Chicago all saying we got a problem. We got to fix this. We do have a problem. It is fixable. It just takes the will to go and do it. We had fiscal spending we got to get in order. We got to make sure that that we go back to domestic energy production in the United States so we are energy independent again. These are things that I, I, I want to go and work on. But the U.S. is also facing international crises. Well, Israel and Gaza, I, I would be make sure there's absolutely no daylight between the United States and Israel and Israel's absolute right to defend itself against Hamas in Gaza. I would also recognize that there is a there, there is a puppeteer here, and that's Iran. So I would also be part of uh, uh, being aware of 
getting American ships in place so that if Iran wants to escalate this thing, they better know that they're going to face the might of, of the Americans. So that, that we've got to be strong there. Critics have said that uh, Netanyahu's bombing of Gaza is too indiscriminate, that too many civilian lives and Palestinian women and children are being killed because of that. Should the United States intervene in that? The last thing we need to do is be the backseat driver to a country who was invaded and violated and had thousands of individuals die unprovoked. Now, I have great empathy for the innocent civilians of the Gaza Strip and the Palestinians, but they had an opportunity to push Hamas out and they didn't. So they are unfortunately the victims of a tragic incident. So no, as the United States, we should not be backstreet driving uh, Israel and their absolute right to defend themselves. What about Ukraine? Would you approve the $50 billion in funding needed to keep that war going? So Ukraine is different than Israel. But the first thing I wish I was in the U.S. Senate is because I would have made sure that the Americans understood what our mission is. And for me, it's pushing Putin and Russia back to the 2022 boundary lines. And that way, all the ammunition, all the aid, all the weaponry, which I do support going to Ukraine, could be measured against that result. The problem the Biden administration has done is Americans don't know what we are achieving in that war. We got to we got to set out a focus. The other thing is we are not writing blank checks to Ukraine. We are we are writing checks to American companies, American uh, weaponry. 38 states receive a lot of this Ukrainian money, including Ohio. The Lima tank plant has received Ukrainian money to produce tanks to go over to Ukraine. How do you distinguish yourself between your two opponents coming up in this primary? Well, one is they're saying they can do it. I've done it. That's a huge difference. The other is I am consistent. I have been a consistent conservative with, with what has achieved results. I mean, Bernie Marino, when he was a private sector, he, he believed in, in a road to residency for the illegal immigrants. Now he wants to kick every baby out of this country. Frank LaRose is all over on every single issue. The reality is, is I work for every day to make Ohioans' lives better, and I have results to achieve it. Before I let you go, what is one thing you want voters to know about you? Well, I think uh, uh, people have an impression of who I am because my family has been successful. The reality is I'm a product of a U.S. Marine and a Catholic nun. I grew up in a house of faith, hard work, and sense of community. I work really hard for the people of Ohio. I've worked really hard in the private sector with my family to achieve success. My motivations is to figure out what will make your life better. How do Ohioans' lives improve? How can everyone out there achieve the American dream like my parents? Since 2010, Ohio voters have elected Republicans into every statewide office and into the U.S. Senate, except for Senator Sherrod Brown. And with Ohio seemingly turning more red every election cycle, there's a reason why Republicans are optimistic about their chances in November. Matt Barnes talked to a top elections forecaster about the Senate race in Ohio and what it will take for Brown to defend his seat. We're in a time where the presidential partisanship of a state really matches up with how the, the you know, states vote for Senate. Um, there are only five senators of the 100 across the country who represent states that their party did not win in the 2020 presidential election. Um, and of course, uh, you know, Sherrod Brown in Ohio is one of them as a Democrat in a Trump one state. So uh, it's an extremely important race to both sides. Kyle Kondik is an elections expert and an Ohio native, and as he forecasts the 2024 Senate race in the Buckeye State, he classifies Sherrod Brown's chances right now of winning as a toss-up. Um, he's been, you know, pretty successful over the years, and I think there probably is still some residual down ballot strength for Democrats in certain places, or at least for a, you know, relatively popular incumbent like Sherrod Brown. Um, but we're also in an era where that kind of ticket splitting is um, maybe harder to attain. With such little polling being done on the Republican primary race, Condic isn't sure how to handicap who has the edge between Frank LaRose, Matt Dolan, and Bernie Marino. He says Donald Trump's endorsement of Marino could matter or could not, depending on the state of the presidential primary. By the time Ohio votes, uh, it may or may not be the case that the presidential primary is still competitive. But if the presidential primary is competitive, um, you'd expect a big turnout. Uh, and I don't necessarily know who that, who that would benefit.
As far as the issues, Condic says both sides think they have a strong argument. Republicans, I think, feel like they've got advantages on a lot of the issues going on right now, be it the economy or um, immigration or some other things. Um, but Democrats definitely have an edge on abortion rights. And you see that in really blue states and you see that in really red states, too. Uh, and so naturally, you're going to expect, um, you know, Democratic Senate candidates, including Sherry Brown, to run on that issue all over the country. And no matter who wins the primary, Condic expects this to be the toughest fight yet for Brown to keep his seat. Brown has benefited in his Senate races of running in, in three good Democratic environments. 2006 was a, one of the best years for Democrats um, probably ever in the state of Ohio. And nationally, it was a huge wave. 2012, Barack Obama won Ohio, won re-election. Sherrod Brown did a little bit better than, than Obama, but they ran pretty closely together. And then in 2018 was another you know Democratic uh, midterm under a Republican president. I think in terms of political environment, this is probably the hardest environment Brown's going to have because he's going to be you know running in a state that is very likely to re vote Republican for president. And keep this recent history in mind. In the last two presidential elections, only one senator won their race when their state voted for the president of the opposing party. That was Republican Susan Collins in Maine in 2020, which ultimately went to Biden. Reporting for The Spectrum, I'm Matt Barnes. At the State House, lawmakers are gearing up to override two separate vetoes from Governor DeWine. We'll take a look at the State House agendas when we come back. We continue to look ahead to what could be on tap in Ohio politics this year, and the General Assembly has a lot on their agenda, including two possible veto overrides. State House reporter Natalie Fame tells us what state lawmakers are expected to work on in the coming weeks. There are some pieces of legislation that have been a work in progress and will likely continue to move forward this year. But others, like a multi-billion dollar spending bill, will be a new undertaking in 2024. Before the new year, legislators were working on several bills, including legislation to tweak the state's newly enacted recreational marijuana law. A bill did pass the Senate, but the House did not take it up. Now there are competing bills and ideas in both chambers. The Speaker of the Ohio House says he wants to get something done early this year. We can also schedule a session, you know, once we're able to, to figure all this out, you know, and, and get it done if we, we need to do that. As for new legislation, the state's capital budget, a multi-billion dollar biannual bill, will likely be introduced within the next few weeks. It appropriates money for construction and renovations across the state, and parts of it focus on community investments. What is something that that local community needs or an area needs that's really going to make a difference and move the needle? The capital budget will likely pass from the state house in the spring or early summer. At least two veto overrides could also be on deck this year. Action has already been taken to override the governor's veto on a provision that would ban local municipalities from barring the sale of flavored tobacco products. The House overrode the veto before the new year. A Senate Republican spokesperson tells me the veto override would have support within their chamber, but there is no timeline for when that might be done at this point. Just for uniformity's sake, but also from a job standpoint, we felt it was best you know, 60 of us felt it was best to go ahead and override that veto. It was, uh, I think, a very poor decision and uh, surprised that that kind of energy was put into this override. Uh, but it speaks to, I think, how powerful the tobacco lobby remains even here uh, at the State House. House Bill 68 may also have a veto override vote. That bill is the Safe and Save Women Sports Act, which the governor just vetoed on Friday. Both provisions of the bill would impact transgender youth in Ohio, and Republican lawmakers are already gearing up to take the vote to override the governor's decision. Lawmakers have until the end of the General Assembly or the end of this year to override any vetoes. The Ohio House is reconvening this week to attempt to override the House Bill 68 veto. As of now, the Ohio Senate's first scheduled session is January 24th. At the State House, I'm Natalie Fahmy reporting for the Spectrum. Veto overrides at the State House, border battles on Capitol Hill, and a hotly contested Senate race in Ohio. Our experts weigh in when we come back.
Welcome back. We are joined in our roundtable this week by Democrat strategist David Pepper and Republican strategist back with us, Mark Weaver. And uh, lots going on uh, in Washington and here in Ohio. But let's talk first about this pending Senate race, because all eyes are going to be on Ohio for a very important showdown. Republicans, Mark, think that Sherrod Brown is vulnerable, don't they? Ohio has grown redder while he's been here. He's lost a lot of support in the Mahoning Valley, which now votes Republican. And he's going to have a very powerful opponent, either Frank LaRose or Bernie Moreno or Matt Dolan. And do you agree with that? Is he vulnerable? I mean, I think it's a tougher race, his toughest race, and I think he knows that. So, yeah, he's got to fight hard, uh, but he way overperformed the last time he was on the ballot. And I think if, if the presidential race stays relatively close, I think he can overperform again and, and win, just like he did in 18. You know, I got to ask you, David, I've had Democrats say to me that Bernie Marino, who now has the endorsement of Donald Trump, would be the easiest candidate for Sherrod Brown to go up against because they are so starkly different. Do you agree with that? Is that, a, is that what, what, Sherrod Brown should want Marino? I mean, I think he'd be confident against running run against anybody, but yeah, I think Marino against Sherrod Brown's a good matchup. I mean, if you look closely at um, a couple of years ago, uh, J.D. Vance did far worse than Mike DeWine. It was 25 point spread versus six point spread. It shows you that voters didn't like the Trumpy candidate, at least as much as the more moderate candidate. And if Marino ends up falling into that Vance Trump type of bucket, I think it does give Sherrod uh, some opportunity, just like we saw in 22, that huge spread between again to Wine and Rose. But but his that endorsement really helped advance. It, it does. It, it's it hard was to compare. vital to him. It's true. It's hard to compare a non-presidential year like 2022 with a yeah. presidential year. It could be a bigger turnout. Trump won this state twice by eight or eight points or better. I, I think Bernie Moreno might be helped by a Trump endorsement. I, I want to ask you too about something going on at the state house. Uh, Governor DeWine issued a transgender bill veto right before. For Christmas. Uh, a lot of people were applauding him. A lot of people were criticizing him. There was some division, but we know at the State House, that's almost a veto proof vote, isn't it? I mean, Republicans at the State House want that transgender bill. Will he be overridden? I think he will. Uh, the question really is not whether the votes are there, it's whether the warm bodies are in the chamber because at this time of year, people are sick or they're traveling. So it's less about whether it's going to be overridden, whether then, then it, whether there'll be enough people there to override it. But this is a governor going up against leaders of his own party in the state house. Some people are also saying, you know, he's not going to be running for office again. He doesn't have to worry about political expediency anymore, does he? No, but I think this is a perfect example of why it was so wrong for him to go along with it, with the unconstitutional gerrymandering. I don't think they could override the veto if Mike DeWine himself hadn't have voted multiple times against the Ohio Supreme Court, against the Constitution to lock in what is clearly an artificially big supermajority. So, you know, his lack of courage a couple of years ago is coming to, back to haunt him when I do think, to his credit, he showed some backbone this time. And we might be seeing that gerrymandering come out on the ballot in November because we know that there's that group trying to get citizen-led districts. Do you think we're going to see that in the new year? The, ma the minority party always says gerrymander, and it's often true, sometimes it's not. <laughs> but remember, taking the politics out of redistricting is like taking the tomato out of tomato soup. It's always going to be political. And we're going to talk a little bit more about politics in Washington when we come back. Stay with us. Welcome back. It's not surprising we are seeing some division in Washington, especially over border security. Chuck Schumer in the Senate said this week, we are close to a compromise. House leaders in the Republican Party say we're not going to take that compromise. What should we think about all of this? David, we'll start with you. Well, my sense from talking to friends I have in Washington is if you had the Republican senators and the, and the Democrats in the House and Senate working out, you'd have deals. You'd have a deal on the on the border. You'd have budget deals. But I think what we have now is a House that is basically doing the bidding of Donald Trump. And we've seen in the last couple of days, they don't want to do anything that helps Biden going into a presidential year. And that's why I think there's a real risk of a shutdown. And there's also going to be no progress on the border. So if you left it to the Republicans and Democrats in the Senate, I think you'd see things worked out. But right now, the new speaker in this very narrow House majority is basically, I think, doing Trump's will. Do you, do you agree with that? I mean, do you think that new speaker might be worried he's going to go the way of Kevin McCarthy? 
Mike Johnson doing a great job. The will he's doing is the American people's will. If you read the polls, people are very upset about the borders not being enforced. It's a it's a drug crisis. It's a human services crisis. It's an economic crisis. So the House is saying, let's shut down our border and enforce our laws. Most Americans agree. But don't you think most Americans also want compromise? They want to see government functioning. And most Americans gave us a Democrat senator and a Republican <laughs> House, and divided government means divided views on but, policy. But the House Republicans aren't doing anything about any of it. I mean, they, they aren't funding it. They have no plan for it. They may have press conferences down on the border. But at some point, like, there are deals to make something happen, and they go along with none of them, just like I think we very likely could see a shutdown because I don't see the new speaker having the, the guts to actually come to agreement on that either. But yeah, the Republicans say that about the Senate, that the Senate won't pass their legislation. This is the essence of divided yeah, government. It sure is. And that government shutdown is probably looming once again. And it's one of the things we'll be talking about on future episodes of The Spectrum. We'll see you next week.